My name is Dale Fredland, and in the time allotted today, I would like us to start the journey towards a better understanding of how to analyze the stability of soil and rock slopes. Why is the stability analysis so complicated? I have identified three main reasons why the slope stability problem is complicated. If we are going to apply statical equilibrium, we must start with a free body diagram. As strange as it may seem, we do not have a free body diagram to start with. We do not know the shape and the location of the slip surface. And then if we try to apply statical equilibrium, the problem must be determinant. In other words, the number of known equations to work with and the number of unknowns must be equal to one another. In our slope stability problem, it turns out that the problem is indeterminate. That's a problem. And the third reason I have suggested why it's difficult is there is such a wide range of mass movements that are possible. We have <clears throat> different types of movements. We have rock falls, we have topples, we have slides, we have spread flows. And we have many different kinds of materials, soft materials to rock materials. And we also have various pore water pressures conditions to deal with. And we have various shapes for the sliding surface. All of these things make our problem very complicated. Varnes in 1978 identified a number of different types of slides. Uh, he said we can have rotational rock slides in shale, for example. We can have rotational earth slides in clay materials. They're rotational. We can also have translational rock slides. And we can have translational earth slides. Varnes also gave us a typical circular arc slip surface and the various components that go along with mass movement from the crown or the scarp right down to the toe of the slope. This is the type of um, slip surface and sliding mass that we usually assume when doing a slope stability analysis. We take one slice through the middle, the deepest part of the sliding mass, and that is the, the earth mass that we are going to uh, consider in our analysis. It's not always easy to find where the ex limits are of the sliding mass. This picture was taken along the highway between Guayaquil, Ecuador, and Peru. And if you look along the, the, this roadway, you see that there are large scarps of mass movement above the road, and there are large movements below. In fact, there are so many movements that one sliding mass intersects with another. And so to, to figure out where you're going to start your stability analysis is a complicated matter. But here is the, our starting problem. We do not have a free body diagram. What do I mean by that? We have a ground surface, we have stratigraphy, but we do not know the shape or the location of the sliding surface. We have to assume a shape. And then we have to try to find the location of it through a trial and error process. Let me go into some of the history of two-dimensional slope stability analysis. In 1915, there was a massive landslide in Gothenburg Harbor in Sweden. It disrupted shipping and bringing of ships into the port. <clears throat> and Pedersen was set up to uh, head a, the Swedish Geotechnical Institute and figure out how can we analyze um, sliding masses such as this. 
One of the things that came out of his study was that the slip surface, when they investigated, was near circular in shape. And that is the study that identified the shape of the slip surface in clay materials. Nothing much came out of that study in 1915. It actually, uh, everything on slope stability seemed to lay dormant until in 1936 they had another landslide. This time Philenius was put in charge of trying to analyze when, a, when slopes would fail. And he came up with the method of slices. He took a slice through the sliding mass and then divided it into vertical slices. And this became known as the ordinary method or the conventional method or the Philenius method. You find it with several names. Uh, he, sh I show here the free body diagram for one slice and at the base he puts a normal and a shear force and then the weight acting down. He left off the forces between the slices. That was in 1936. Not much was done until in 1955 Alan Bishop from Imperial College completed his PhD thesis. His, his work was published in Geotechnique. It's interesting that he came up with two formulations. He formulated a factor of safety equation for force equilibrium, horizontal force equilibrium, and one for moment equilibrium. But he could not find uh, a, a way to solve for both force and moment at the same time, so he chose to the moment equilibrium factor of safety equation and, and wrote uh, and, and solved now for factor of safety in terms of moment equilibrium. He also summed forces vertically on each slice. You'll notice on the right hand side the free body diagram of a single slice has both a normal and a shear force on the slides. This is the correct free body diagram for an individual slice. He also took into consideration the effect of, the, of four pore water pressures and so his analysis became effective. Effective stress analysis for slope stability. This was in 1955. Ten years later, Morgenstern completed his PhD thesis at Imperial College and he came up with a way to solve for both moment and force uh, equilibrium at the same time. Shown on this slide is the free body diagram with the forces uh, on the inter, inner slice forces. And, uh, but it, it lacked an understanding of the free body uh, of, of the forces between the slices. Now the objective of our teaching today is really to summarize the common limit equilibrium methods of slices with a focus on those various, the various names which have been attached to um, the different methods of slices and to understand why there's a gradual change that has emerged in how we do slope stability analysis. I hope to also comment on the strengths and the weaknesses associated with various slope stability calculation procedures. This will just be about a half an hour talk today and subsequent talks will look at more recent advances where we take into consideration um, uh, the independent stress analysis and how independent stress analysis can contribute to solving our problem. Also the use of optimization techniques to locate the critical factor of safety. And also I will comment in, uh, in future talks on the effects of three-dimensional analysis. So here is a slice through a sliding mass. I show one diagram in the, uh, one slice in the middle, and on that slice I put a normal and a shear on each side. 
Every time a plane is passed through a, a, a soil mass, you have to put a shear and a normal on that plane. So that this free body diagram shows all of the forces that we could put on our problem. Our focus is going to be on the shear force mobilized S sub M because S sub M is going to differ for the different uh, methods of stability analysis. It's going to differ because the normal force is part of the shear force mobilized and the normal force is calculated in a slightly different way for each of the methods of slices. There are assumptions that are common to all the limit equilibrium methods of slices and they are as follows. First of all, the soil is assumed to behave as a more Coulomb material. That means that the soil is assumed to have a friction angle and an intercept called cohesion. The assumption is made for all limit equilibrium methods of slices also that the factor of safety with respect to cohesion is equal to the factor of safety with respect to the frictional component. We can write the shear force mobilized at the, in the form of this, as show, uh, shown in this equation. You have a cohesion part. Multiplied by a distance gives you a force. So the top part of the equation here is a frictional part and a cohesion part, and it's the strength of the material. The factor of safety is the factor by which the shear strength of the material must be reduced in order to bring the sliding mass to a state of limiting equilibrium. The factor of safety will be always uh, assumed to be equal for all slices. Now let's look at trying to solve, uh, a, a lim do a limit equilibrium analysis of a slope. Let's summarize how many knowns we have to try to solve the problem. And then we will look at the number of unknowns. And in order to solve the problem, they have to be equal. So the little n is, means it's the number of, uh, of variables per slice. So we have static equilibrium. And for a two-dimensional analysis, we have three statics equations. We have moment equilibrium, one for each slice. We have vertical force equilibrium, one for each slice. And we have horizontal force equilibrium, one equation for each slice. In addition, we can write the more Coulomb failure criteria for each slice. And so if you add those up, you say you have four N equations in order to try to solve our problem. Now let's look at what are our unknowns. The unknowns in our problem. The normal at the base of the slice, of each slice, is an unknown. The shear force at the base of the slice is an unknown. The interslice normal force is n minus 1 unknowns, and likewise with the interslice shear forces. And there's the point of application and, and so on. We add and then there is one factor of safety. If we add all those unknowns together, we get a total of 6n minus 2. Let's just ignore the minus 2 for a minute, but it's quite clear that we have 6n un minus 2 unknowns, and that number is bigger than 4n equations to work with. We have more unknowns than what we have knowns, and therefore we say the problem is indeterminate. When a problem is indeterminate, we have one of two choices to make. We can say, I'm going to uh, bring further physics to bear on my problem. I'm going to bring uh, more equations to bear. That until I have the same number of knowns as unknowns, or else I can throw away some forces. I can make assumptions that certain forces are not important. 
So we have one of two possibilities. Interestingly, all the different methods of analysis of, that have come up until the most recent ones have decided to throw away some of the forces, and we'll look at that. I give a list of some of the methods of slices analysis on the left-hand side, and I put a red circle around the normal force, because that is what differs in all of these methods. If you calculate the normal force n, it differs. And because the normal force is part of the shear force mobilized, or the shear strength of the soil, it changes S sub m. So let's look at some of the assumptions that were made and how the normal force is calculated. So the point I want to make there is that the different methods of analysis have different ways of calculating the normal force, and that's why we get factors of safety that are different. But there will be a second uh, reason why they differ as well, and I'll talk about that later. So the limit equilibrium methods can be identified in terms of the assumptions they make to make the analysis determinate, and what elements of physics they use to solve. The ordinary method, it, it just let the near slice E and X be zero and ignored them. And it solved for a moment factor of safety equation. But the method seemed to give factors of safety that varied quite widely in comparison to other more rigorous methods. So if we come to Bishop's method, he satisfied summation of forces vertical and summation of moments equilibrium for the, um, the sliding mass. What about the summation of forces horizontal? He ignored it. We have an analysis that does not uh, satisfy horizontal force equilibrium. The assumption to make his prob analysis determinate was he let the interslice normal be horizontal, but the shears he set to zero. Now, Jan Bu did something quite similar. He included the interslice normal, but he let the interslice shear go to zero. But then he satisfied vertical force and horizontal force equilibrium, and he never satisfied moment equilibrium. He threw it away out of the analysis. Now, let's just jump to the bottom there. And Spencer made an assumption regarding the, sh the slope of the interslice normal and shear resultant. And then he satisfied vertical, horizontal, and moment equilibrium. Likewise, Morgenstern Price satisfied all elements of equilibrium as well. But let's just take a moment to look at Bishop's and Jan Bu's methods. The free body diagram of a slice shows that there's an interslice normal force, but the interslice shears are set to zero. It sums forces vertically to get the normal force, and, and the shears are never appear. Spencer's method is somewhat similar to Morgenstern Price. It's a special case of Morgenstern Price, and GLE stands for General Limit Equilibrium, because we're, instead of attaching a person's name to it, General li Limit Equilibrium just says we're going to use Not Newtonian mechanics. And Morgenstern and Price were the ones who um, elected to have a, a functional relationship between the, ec the shears and the normal. And so they chose a functional relationship. And now when they uh, added that equation and added all their knowns and unknowns, they fi found, lo and behold, they had overstated the problem. What does that mean? It means now they had one more equations than they needed to solve the problem. So what did they do? They introduced another unknown called lambda, which is a percentage, certain percentage of the functional relationship. So now they had an equal number of unknowns and an equal number of 
elements of physics, equations to work with, and so the problem was rendered determinate. Now, Morgenstern and Price assumed a, a variety of shapes for the um, relationship between the shear and the normal. And then Wilson, one of my grad students in 1983, decided to apply uh, stress analysis to um, a, a slope and calculate the actual ratio between x and E. And he got a shape that was like this. Now this, this is uh, a shape that's based on theory of elasticity, of applying the gravity, switching on gravity, and it produces a shape like this. It's an extended error type of function. So the equation here that's proposed is Morgenstern Price equation, but the functional relationship is based on stress analysis. And Wilson found out that no matter what slope, he, he, he did hundreds and thousands of analysis, and he found that the shape could always be fit by an equation that is an equation for an extended error function. And takes this form, and the one unknown is n, which is a function of the steepness of the slope of the ground surface. So if you know the steepness of the ground surface, you can calculate this function. And it is the function based on, uh, on an elastic analysis. Now let's take a look at calculating the, for, uh, the um, moment equilibrium factor of safety and the force equilibrium factor of safety for the case where we have a circular slip surface and see what we can learn from this. On the uh, bottom here, we plot lambda. Lambda can be thought of as the percentage of the function that you need or that you decide to use. Over here with zero lambda, there is no interslice shear. It's just a normal force and the moment the force equilibrium gives us a factor of safety down here. The moment is up here. The moment equilibrium factor of safety is almost a horizontal line. We will recall also that Bishop's simplified method ignored the interslice shear, so he was really assuming zero lambda. And as we change the amount of the function, the force equilibrium factor of safety changes significantly, but the moment does not. And this is the reason why it came, uh, geotechnical engineers came to rationalize that Bishop's is similar to Morgenstern, Bishop's is similar to Morgenstern Price. Well, it is for a circular slip surface. So what can we summarize out of this? We can say that the crossover between the moment equilibrium equation and the force equilibrium equation gives you a factor of safety that satisfies complete equilibrium. For a circular slip surface, the factor of safety with respect to moment equilibrium is insensitive to your function for interslice forces. Bishop's method is close to the Morgenstern price for a circular slip surface. The Fellinius can be vary quite widely, and we will not spend time on trying to understand it further. The force equilibrium is very sensitive to your interslice force function, and Spencer's analysis gives you the same gave the same value as Morgenstern Price, showing that even though Spencer assumed a different interslice force function, it still didn't affect the factor of safety very much at the point where moment and force equilibrium are satisfied. Now let's take a look at a planar slip surface, one like this, and it's divided into vertical slices like this. And let's solve the force equilibrium factor of safety equation and the moment equilibrium for this planar slip surface. 
We plot factor of safety on the ordinate versus lambda on the abscissa. We notice that one line is varying quite significantly with lambda, but it turns out to be the moment equilibrium equation that's varying. And now this time, the force equilibrium equation does not vary significantly when you have a planar slip surface. So the relationship between force equilibrium and moment equilibrium is dependent on the shape of the slip surface. So what can we learn from that? The crossover between force and moment equilibrium satisfies complete equilibrium conditions. This time, the moment equilibrium is sensitive to what you choose for an interslice force function. Bishop's factor of safety for moment equilibrium is below, below the force equilibrium. And the force equilibrium, the moment equilibrium is quite sensitive now to your interslice force function. So there's quite a difference in the two factors of safety depending upon the shape of the slip surface. Well, what happens if we have a composite sliding mass where part of it is circular and part of it is planar, as shown here? Now, this top line here is moment equilibrium. Whereas it was a horizontal line for a circular slip surface, now it varies significantly. So moment equilibrium varies with the interslice force function. The force equilibrium factor of safety also varies, but there is a crossover point. So you always satisfy complete equilibrium if you solve Morgenstern Price method. And we conclude that the crossover between moment and force equilibrium gives you overall, uh, it's the overall factor of safety satisfying moment and force equilibrium. Both moment and force equilibrium are sensitive to the interslice force function for a composite slip surface. Bishop's method can be below the Morgenstern price, and we now have a reason why. We know why it is. The interslice force function is dependent on the shape of the ground surface, primarily. But independent solutions for moment and force provides additional information it, uh, it provides information on the importance of the interslice force function. With the uh, development of computer software now, Morgenstern Price method can be solved very rapidly, and so it becomes the preferred method for solving for limit equilibrium. So what can we conclude thus far? That Morgenstern Price, or the GLE method, and the GLE method uh, solves it using a newton raphson technique that is um, uh, very consistent with the type of diagrams I just showed. So Morgenstern price, we should always be solving for complete equilibrium because it's the computers solve it so rapidly. Limit equilibrium methods differ mainly in the assumptions made regarding the interslice forces and the elements of static equilibrium that are satisfied. We can also conclude that the relationship between various limit equilibrium factors of safety depends mainly on the shape of the slip surface. So the relationship between the factors of safety for moment and force equilibrium depends on the shape of the slip surface. The interslice force function depends on the ground surface. And so we see the independent effect of these two aspects. I want to conclude this lecture asking a question. Because we have focused on normal and said that all the methods are different because they calculate the normal stress in slightly different ways, there's different assumptions there. Is it possible that there could still be a further 
way to e calculate the normal stress even better. And I, I ask the question in this form, is the normal stress only dependent on the forces on a single vertical slice? Because that's what we have uh, used so far. S or put it another way, is the normal force at the base of each slice as accurate as it is possible to, uh, to be obtained? A schooler did a study where he looked into switching on gravity and doing a stress analysis and then using the stress analysis to calculate the normal force at the base of the slice. So next lecture, we will look at, uh, ask, start out by asking ourselves, is there any other way we can calculate the normal force, stress and force more accurately? So there is still much more to learn about slope stability analysis. That concludes the first lecture.